Why do I feel this way? A look at appraisal theories of emotion, presented by me, Candace Hayden. This presentation will cover Imana and Ellsworth's article, Proud Americans and Lucky Japanese, Cultural Differences in Appraisals and Corresponding Emotion. Today we're going to be talking about appraisal theories of emotion. I'll answer questions like, what is it? How does it work? And why is it important to understand? After that, we'll dive into how we interpret our past failures and successes and why they make us feel the way we do and how culture may play a role in that outcome. To wrap things up, we will explore how we are likely to act in situations in the future and why others may react differently than you. When I think of an appraisal, I think of my wedding ring. Besides the insurance company requiring it, I want to know how much that rock is worth. If we want something appraised, we take it to an expert. They look it over, test the quality, evaluate it against the current market, and they come back with a price. You can get anything praised really, houses, cars, baseball cards, but what about everyday situations that lead to our emotions? Let's talk about emotions. Emotions come from how we view and explain events in our lives, or also known as appraisals. So when I get a gift, I feel emotion. These could be love, joy, happiness, and so on. The appraisal is how I interpret getting the gift, which in turn results in experiencing a particular emotional response. But what if someone else got the same gift, but instead they felt guilt, anxiety, and nervousness? Why is that? Psychologists agree that emotions are made up of multiple ingredients, values, goals, culture, and many other variables that shape how we appraise an event in our lives. While we know these ingredients shape how we appraise situations and in turn dictate our emotions, there's a lot of disagreement on this recipe. We see this in siblings all the time. Say we look at two sisters, Betty and Lindsay, who are fraternal twins. For their 10th birthday, their parents throw them a big birthday party extravaganza. Bounce house, petting zoo, DJ, the works. The night before the party, Betty announces to her family at dinner that she is now vegan and requests that all her meals from this point on need to be vegan friendly. Her family applauds her choice to be vegan and is super supportive. The next day, the birthday party went perfectly. The sisters loved the bounce house. The animals were cute and cuddly and the DJ played all their favorite songs. However, when it came time to eat, her parents ordered pepperoni pizza and brought out a beautiful dairy-filled cake. Lindsay saw the cake and pizza and became overjoyed. She loves pepperoni pizza and cake. Betty, on the other hand, became sad and tearfully emotional. You see, Betty valued her choice to become a vegan. And when her parents placed non-vegan options in front of her on her birthday, she interpreted the situation as violating a personally held value of hers. She interpreted the situation differently than her sister because she held different values and because it was appraised differently, their emotional responses were different. So does this mean emotional responses are different for everybody? Well, yes and no. We all experience situations from our own point of view. And we even tend to see and experience things the way we want to. So therefore, we all have different emotional responses. However, we experience similar appraisals as a society. That is where culture comes into play. Researchers Toshi Yamada and Phoebe Ellsworth wanted to know how Americans appraise success and failure compared to the Japanese, two very different cultures. But before we get into their study, we need to know a few important aspects of individualistic and collectivist cultures. In this case, 
Americans, and Japanese. In an individualistic culture such as the United States, how we view failure and success is largely based on improving our own self esteem. We see this in sports all the time. When a team wins, you will hear them say statements like, We trained really hard, or Everyone played their best, that's why we won today. We internalize this success because it makes us feel good and it boosts our self esteem. But when the same team loses, you may hear statements like, the refs made a lot of bad calls. They deflect the failure on outside circumstances out of their control. By placing blame on something outside of our control, we maintain our self-esteem. In collectivist cultures such as Japan, they do not place a high value on self-esteem and tend to focus more on self-criticism. So if we were to use the same sports example as before, a winning team would be more likely to make a statement like, we won today because we were just a little bit luckier than the other team. They will attribute their success to outside sources and will not internalize success like Americans. The opposite is true for failures as well. The losing sports team may make statements such as, we were not prepared or we made too many mistakes. Collectivist cultures are more likely to internalize their failures, which can result in emotions such as shame and guilt. Now back to the study. Imada and Ellsworth hypothesized that people in the United States and Japan would experience different emotions when experiencing or thinking about success and failure. So to test this theory, they took 77 American undergraduate students and 58 Japanese students and asked them to think about previous situations in their lives in which they had failed and succeeded. They were asked to describe what caused these events to happen and then report the resulting emotions they felt from the, that event. The researchers tested this data in a multitude of ways and found some interesting results. Broken down when looking at personal appraisals, meaning we felt we were the cause for the success or failure, Americans were more likely to make self-enhancing and self-protective appraisals, which was not very surprising. And as expected, Japanese attributed success to both themselves and the situation, but less to themselves than Americans. Also, not surprisingly, Japanese were far more likely to blame themselves for a failure than Americans, who were more likely to blame personal failures on outside circumstances. When Imada and Ellsworth looked at how the two cultures appraised success and failures based off of social situations, there were a few changes. When a social failure was remembered, the Japanese equally blamed themselves, the situation, and others. Americans still blamed others more than they did themselves. To examine these results even further, the researchers controlled types of agency appraisals, self, situation, and social. When they did this, their results for personal success and failure became far less significant, meaning that the difference in cultural emotion may largely be due to different agency appraisals. For their second study, they wanted to expand on what they learned from study one. Remember they found that differing cultural emotional responses were due largely to agency appraisals. So therefore they hypothesized that if Americans and Japanese appraised a situation in the same way, then they would experience the same emotions. They tested this theory by showing the two groups vignettes. One vignette would specifically tell the participants what the appraisal was, like personal success. The other vignette would not. This was used as a control. They tested the appraisals <clears throat> thoroughly between the two groups and found that indeed Americans and Japanese did experience similar emotions. The researchers found that when the situation was appraised the same, with the slight exception of personal success, the two groups felt similar emotions. When it came to personal success, the Japanese students still tended to attribute that success to the situation and others than to themselves. Imada and Ellsworth's research was consistent with the universal contingency hypothesis. 
which in short states that general situations such as success and failure will have a general pattern of appraisal that spans across different cultures, simply meaning all cultures will experience and appraise things. However, culture influences how we appraise a situation, resulting in different emotional responses. Before we wrap things up, there are a few noteworthy criticisms to point out about this study. One criticism that is important to mention involves the method of the study. Whenever researchers conduct a cross-cultural study, language interpretation can be very tricky, just as Google Translate. The meaning of emotional terms cannot always be accurately translated between languages, so therefore there may be some confusion or disconnect between the two groups. The second criticism to point out are the questions that researchers asked to the participants. Because the participants were asked about past and hypothetical situations, their answers may have been different from how they actually perceived those past situations and what the resulting emotions were in the moment. The same is true for hypothetical situations. As mentioned earlier, research has shown we tend to perceive situations the way we want to, so our responses and emotions may be different when thinking about hypothetical events. So what does this all mean? Everyone appraises situations differently, and researchers have found that culture plays a vital role in those appraisals. This means it's important to continue studying how culture influences the process of emotions. Why is this important? So we continue to grow towards understanding each other. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found this helpful. Check out the article if you're interested.